Thank you so much, everybody. Um, I think when you're doing a talk about the fear of failure and you're following some incredible UNIS ambassadors, it's hard not to inject your um, thoughts a little bit with some imposter syndrome, especially after following Dr. Donaldson. So it, in, in many ways, I feel a little bit like, you know, what am I doing here? Because I am just this country girl from Western Australia. Uh, Interestingly, the, the, the talk tonight, uh, I thought I'd combine two concepts. So the fear of failure and ushering in a world of three zeros, how to lead social innovation when everyone says it's impossible. And I think um, I come from a practitioner's perspective, um, a, a, you know, unlike in the, the academic world, I guess, a bit like Professor Yunus, my approach today will be a bit more from a, a worm's eye view than a bird's eye view. And before we talk about ushering in the world of three zeros, I might give you a little bit of context because um, how we got here and the origin story um, for myself and, and Grameen sort of <coughs> informs this conversation. So I was born in, I grew up in Geraldton in Western Australia. It's, it's a country town, a very beachy country town, 30,000 people, predominantly crayfishing and mining services. Um, but I was actually born in Manila in the Philippines. So my mum was one of uh, seven kids and they were living in um, the kind of economic conditions that are customary in the Philippines. And she, she moved me out of there when my father um, met her. He's an Australian man and he took us to a country, Western Australia. And she was beset with the kind of mindset that you do get as a first generation migrant mum, which is you've got to get an education. You have all of the talent and all of the potential in all of the world and you can grow up to be any one of these three things, doctor, lawyer, engineer. <laughs> you know, in this vast universe, the investable universe of three possible career choices. Um, and so I, I kind of had these aspirations growing up that I might be a, corp, like a, a human rights lawyer. So that, that was something that I thought, but it, as I went through university, a bit like this, I got swept up in what many of the kids do, I, I guess. And you don't expect to do this, right? But you get swept up in the group thing. And I ended up getting whoosh, siphoned into, believe it or not, structured banking and finance, <laughs> deep securitization at um, national uh, top tier law firm Clayton Newts. And I remember, <laughs> this is actually really funny. <laughs> it's not funny, it's horrifying. Um, uh, so I was trained by actually that uh, AMP general counsel, Brian Salter, back in the day when I was a baby lawyer. And I remember talking to him when we were doing those securitization documents. Brian, is this right? And he's like, I don't know, it hasn't been tested. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, we found out soon enough exactly what that meant. And so that gives you a bit of an insight into the start of my career. And I was doing corporate law and kind of having this real cognitive dissonance. I'm like, all of the adults told me that when I finished school, I would get this job and somehow it would lead to a noble purpose. Like I thought that this was um, what I was meant to do with my life. And yet I'm increasingly further and further away from my values. Why does it feel so disconnected? Um, and I didn't have the answer to that. Um, but I did know that as I was going throughout my 10 year career in first corporate law and then deep funds management and then in technology that I was, um, I was finding it really perplexing that um, one, the perennial problem of corporate is that, you know, how do we increase our 20% year on year NPAT? And it didn't sort of then naturally follow that we would go and solve a problem that um, could create a lot of value for a lot of people, perhaps maybe a humanitarian problem, which would then offer us some value so that we could be sustainable whilst also helping the community. That was seen as absurd because of course the realm of charity and not for profit had to be separate from the realm of for profit and never the twine should meet. And um, in 2006, Dean, start of 2017, I quit my senior corporate job without having one to go to, which was um, quite scary at the time. And I remember before I, I made that choice, I noticed in myself there was a massive fear of failure, a fear of losing status, fear of losing money, a fear of losing my identity, and a fear of losing my friends. Um, and I noticed that this wasn't just me, this was something that was endemic in the entire um, organisational culture. And as I found out soon enough when I did F off, that it was um, endemic in broader society, believe it or not, our, the predominant um, audience for the F off fear of failure movement is 25 to 55 year old uh, young professionals, government workers and people in traditional organisations who want to contribute to the world, but have got a fear of failure that is stopping them from doing so. And um, 
in this time off, I guess you could call it a, a sabbatical. I mean, at the time I called it fun employment. Um, I was writing a lot about reimagining the business models of the future. And it was at that time that uh, I, Grameen Australia reached out to me and had a conversation to which of course I said, um, <laughs> What, why, why, why are you making this approach to me? I don't know if you've seen my LinkedIn, but I have literally none of the like qualifications on the JD. Um, and it, you know, that's kind of a bit endemic of the mindset as well, that we kind of go towards what we already know and we rarely infuse diversity of thought and the way we think about how we um, staff our jobs, but that's really an aside comment. And what really captured my heart and, and mind when I was flicking through a world of three zeros is coming to this page, which is the failures of capitalism. It's actually page one of section one of the first chapter, which makes a lot of sense. And I f it resonated with me because I felt like I lived this experience. It wasn't theoretical. I remember being in um, corporate and, and really seeing that you know, capitalism, and this is what Professor Yuna says, he says that the capitalist system is broken, we're in a system, and he also prefaces this by saying poverty isn't created by the poor, it's created by the institutions and the policies and systems that we wrap around our environment. Um, and so the environment in which we all operate, in which our group think kind of surfaces, is this version of capitalism which is in many ways incomplete. Because the kind of business that is um, privileged in this type of capitalism collapses the point of business altogether. At the moment, we see business as only this kind of vehicle for profit maximisation. But of course, business is simply a, um, a tool, a way of organising to achieve concrete goals. And somewhere along the line, we decided that the concrete goals that we were, you know, the only ones that we were going to achieve, the ones that were in our best interest, in fact, our only interest, is that of um, self-interest, which is profit maximisation. And that is a reflection of a fundamental misunderstanding of the human spirit, which is that the human spirit is inherently selfish. And you know, some might argue that it is, but I would also argue that that's an incomplete um, encapsulation of what humanity's spirit really is, because it is many things. It's well-rounded. It is selfish, perhaps, but it's certainly also selfless and everything in between. Yet what we don't have is, is a fundraising or a capital raising vehicle to um, allow for the expression of those qualities of empathy, of compassion, of love um, through the vehicle of business. And so, you know, what is the consequence of that? Well, it leads to the kind of capitalism that gives rise to the wealth concentration and extreme inequality that we see today. I think one of those crazy stats from Oxfam is um, the top eight people in the world have the same amount of wealth as the bottom 50%. Um, and it's, that's an unacceptable scenario. And I think in, even for them, um, currently the only way, uh, unless sort of the thing that I'm about to say next gets some traction is that you, and I remember I just, I see this so much in corporate is like you get people who go, I really just want to make a heaps and heaps of money so I can join this fancy club with lots of influence and then give my money away and have influence to, to create social good. And you're like, well, that seems really strange when there's also another avenue to do that without kind of um, the extractive damaging consequences of operating simply out of that particular mindset. Um, but what is the antidote um, to this incomplete version of capitalism? And that is unisocial business. The beautiful thing about this is, um, and not to add to the even you know huge lexicon of social enterprise, but so, so social business does two things really um, elegantly. It offers the opportunity to solve for a market problem while solving for a social problem at the same time. The Eunice definition of social business is that it is a non-loss, non-dividend company but non-dividend, right? It is very much for profit, but the profit's intention isn't to make shareholders rich. It is to be hosed back into the vehicle so that it can continue to scale its social impact. And I'll give you some examples of these in a moment. Um, and so the, the, I guess the distinction here, if you're thinking about investing, is that it's different to um, philanthropy because in philanthropy, your charity dollar kind of just goes one way, but in a social business, because it's designed to be profit-making, by the time the um, entrepreneur 
you get investment by the time the entrepreneur is um, able to break even and then return capital you can actually return capital back to the investor which then means that they're able to return and recycle the capital again and again and that's what you see in microfinance which is what Professor Yunus is um, most famous for and the distinction between business is that you're very much intended to use business as a vehicle to create solutions for humanitarian problems, but the intention of the profits isn't to go up and make them rich, it's, it's to continue to scale the operation. So it's marrying both a social, um, a solution to a market problem with a solution to a social problem. And before I go too far down kind of the social business track, which I, I certainly will in a moment, um, I might just you know, touch on Professor Yunus and Grameen Bank, which was really elegantly foreshadowed by um, the Yunus Young Ambassadors. And I thank them very much for um, their work because the, the book actually, A World of Three Zeros, is um, Professor Yunus dedicates it to the young generation who will build a new civilization. And that's precisely what you're doing. And the man who started that 40 odd years ago, um, Professor Yunus, he, he did so in Bangladesh at a time when they were going through the revolution. And he was teaching economics in Chittagong University uh, and in the traditional theoretical way and then walking outside and seeing people dying on the streets. And that was perplexing because how could you teach one thing and witness another? And the problem that he observed there was that there was um, a, a, a problem in terms of getting access to capital. So people, were able to create businesses. I mean, every human is a born entrepreneur. We are all inherently creative, but our systems and structures aren't designed to give you access to capital if you're somebody who doesn't already have property or assets. So the banks wouldn't lend to you unless you could prove that you actually didn't need any money from them. So loan sharks would get you and uh, make sure that you never could um, get in a position where you could get um, money from a bank. And so to, to remedy that situation, Professor Yunus took it upon himself to lend out of his own pocket is $27 between uh, 42 people and then over the past 40 odd years, well, long story short, he found the repayment rates were um, you know, significantly higher than what we would see in Wall Street, somewhere in the order of 97% to 100%, depending on where you are on the globe. And that's been sustained over uh, decades. And he scaled that to $26 billion worth of um, loans issued in Bangladesh now to 8.8 .8 million people. And that's just in Bangladesh and their low income women predominantly, 97% of the borrowers are women. And they started out as low income women who were terrified of having, uh, owning any money or owning any debt in their name. And now we have of the 13 board members of the Grameen Bank, eight of those are um, women borrowers. And in fact, the deposits that have amassed in ba um, Grameen Bank are so large that actually exceed the um, amount of money that they're issuing out. So in fact, the borrowers themselves have become lenders in an ironic creation of a completely new industry. And so, so successful was this model that it's been replicated over 100 times in over 50 countries and Grameen Australia is what one would call such a replication. So we have the great fortune of being often mistaken for Grameen Bank, um, but we're not. Uh, we are, however, what you would call a distant cousin. And I really love how um, Thomas opened today with uh, his, his note, and I'll, I'll read it here so I don't get it wrong, but it's advancing dignity in an indecent world. And I love how you said that your vision, um, it, actually you'll see why I find that delightful, because Grameen Australia's vision is to live in a socially and economically inclusive world in which all humans lead dignified, meaningful lives. And our um, mission is, of course, to play a significant part in ushering in a world of three zeros. So I see that there's kind of an elegant tie up there. Um, and how we are distinct from Grameen Bank is that we are an Australian organisation. We're an Australian public company limited by guarantee. And we've been set up uh, 20 years ago, but predominantly as an overseas aid fund um, with, with philanthropic money. But certainly we are an aspirational social business. And I'll give you some of the examples of where we're really close to actually um, switching and, be and becoming one. Um, but suffice to say, you know, uh, I started this role on the 1st of January and in that time um, <laughs> we've done this kind of reverse 
uh, expansion where most people think you go from a developed country and then go out into the developing world and you know share your insights there um, we've actually done the opposite we've started out in Manila and Cambodia and learned a bunch of things and are taking it to Australia <laughs> um, so now we've got the great opportunity to um, test three pillars of activity um, one homegrown social business which I'll share in a moment in greater detail um, social business partnerships we're going to be um, quite opportunistic about that in the public and private sector uh, and facilitate more and more social businesses to grow and develop. Uh, and uh, I, before I kind of go into the sort of um, specifics of the, the Australian opportunities, I might share a little bit about what we do in Manila and in Cambodia, making sure I'm good for time. Um, so the Manila Social Business Hub, this is your uh, Grameen style of microfinance in Metro Manila. What we have here is um, over four years, we've gotten 7,000 women borrowers. We're actually on track to scale to 13,000. Once we get to 13,000, we'll be at break even. That's about 200 centres and 2.9 million USD worth of loans issued over four years. And the, the thing here is, um, uh, for those of you that don't know, the way that Grameen um, Bank uh, does its lending is it's actually a group lending model, right? So you have a scenario where you don't have asset collateral, so how are you going to inspire people to actually repay? Uh, well, the women are lent to in groups of five. They're all individual business women, um, and they have their own businesses. Um, and what happens is they, the term is six months, they meet every week, and it's positive peer pressure, so there's social collateral. What we found here is that there's a tremendous amount of social and personal transformation that goes on when you have a number of people who have formed a group in a psychologically safe space that go to each other week on week and um, peer coach each other through um, challenging times and also um, have opportunities to share celebrations. It's wonderful kind of what inspirations can come out of that. And on the top left hand, you'll see the women borrowers at a collections meeting because of course they collect the money every week as well as get educated in a course, but they'll start that meeting with a prayer so a prayer meeting Manila's um, Catholic they'll start it with a prayer and then they go in and they talk about their um, their challenges um, in Manila we have a 96% recovery rate and we also have two corporate partnerships one with Telstra Philippines Foundation and one with Oceana Gold and at Telstra Philippines Foundation um, that was inspired two years ago with this desire to um, get kids to actually stay in school because if your parents can't afford your school fees what they end up doing is taking you out of school and so you're, you're not in school anymore. So we thought that we would combine um, uh, kind of uh, advancing their education with offering the parents micro loans so that they could create businesses. And we did that and we created parent co-ops so that they could come together, organise and um, create some sewing businesses and some baking businesses and sell the products. What we found is that more and more kids are staying in school. And interestingly, we, out of 141 borrowers, we've just got the results back from our social impact study. Um, over two years, we've found that visits, business assets have gone up 30%. Um, household income has gone up 25%. And then the last one, which is insane, is that uh, educational expenses, so that's school fees, school uniforms, lunch money, lunch, uh, has gone up 45%. And so the other signal of success, of course, is that out of that school, Telstra has decided that that was successful. They want to replicate it in another school in, a, um, in the Philippines and we're potentially going to um, see if we can do a bit of a plug and play into Australia. So that's the Manila Social Business Hub. Um, I've got a, a bunch of other things, but I won't go into all the detail. You can ask questions if you want later. This is really interesting. So um, this, this is what we do in Cambodia. And in Cambodia, we run a chicken farm uh, out of Siam Reap. And many people ask us, what does a chicken farm have to do with microfinance? And the short answer is it doesn't, but it does have everything to do with the social business because it is a social business. And this is where you can really see the example of finding a social problem and solving it by solving a market problem. Um, and the social problem is that uh, for you know, those of you that are familiar with dump site economics, the uh, 22 Ks outside of CM Reap, there's this dump site. 
and uh, there are scavengers that live on the dump site and they work on the dump site um, and they will get something in the order of $1.50 or $2 a day for 10 or so hours worth of work. You can work part-time or full-time depending on your, um, your uh, I guess, situation. Um, and we initially started by going, well, how can we improve the lives of dump site workers? We started with health and education programs, but um, they didn't actually get them off the dump site. So we thought, well, the market problem that we're facing here is that you've got 4 million people coming through Cambodia every year. You've got a protein deficiency. Uh, we could set up a chicken farm. Um, and being not chicken farmers ourselves, um, we instilled the, well, we commandeered the services of an incredible man from South Australia, incidentally, from Gawler. His name is Ian Curtis, uh, and he is very successful. He actually is a chicken farm in the order of the millions, not, you know, 6,000 that we have. Um, and so he came up to Cambodia and helped us set up a chicken farm because we thought, well, if we could service the market, get our biosecurity and our food security standards up that they are such that they are attractive to uh, tourist, tourists, then we can start not just selling into local restaurants, but potentially some of the resorts and the fancy restaurants and whatnot, and scale it out to maybe even Phnom Penh. Uh, and whilst we were running that operation, we also have then over the past four years had the opportunity to take 20 uh, rubbish dump workers through that program. They've graduated. It's a livestock training program. They're taught all areas of the farm and now they've become graduate chicken farmers. Uh, and one of them, Knack, who is out, so they've also, some of them have been promoted now to leadership positions. Um, our assistant farm manager, Knack, that's his little brother there. They both worked on the dump site. So Knack used to be on $2 a day at the, the dump site and now he's working with us full time. And uh, he also, so he was on $2 a day, now he's on $330 a month. Um, so he's, I guess, increased his income by somewhere in the order of four times and has um, got the opportunity to study. And I, I was interviewing Knack on Facebook the other day and I was like, Knack, what are you studying? And he goes, agriculture. <laughs> I'm like, okay, fair enough. Um, and we've, we've also got the opportunity now, so, so we are close to break even here. So we, we're at 50, we're selling 50 chickens a day. If we sell 120 chickens a day, then we will be viable. We're just going to make sure we keep that up and are able to scale. And that's kind of the challenge right now. So for us, you know, it's really critical, it's mission critical that we're very disciplined in our processes and in our monitoring and, and whatnot over the next few weeks. Um, and I can talk about the scaling strategy separately. I think I've made my point. Social problem, um, rubbish dump workers, how to get them off the dump site, market problem, um, servicing the tourists in Cambodia, um, solve that with the help of partners. And so I think, am I I'm okay for time? Yeah. So uh, I guess the, the challenge that we have here when we think about how social business can start to form a more complete um, uh, a, m a more complete version of the kind of capitalist system that we would like to see in a, in a more balanced economy um, can lead to outcomes of zero poverty, zero unemployment and zero net carbon emissions. So zero poverty in the sense that you're dealing with income inequality by offering people access to um, things that are going to lift their income, namely microcredit and opportunities. Zero unemployment, and this is the really important thing and you touched on it before, um, was that Professor Yunus believes that every human is a born entrepreneur and what our institutions often do is that we um, get people job ready which is quite a um, diminishing concept really to reduce human beings to jobs and widgets that slot into lovely holes. Um, actually we were not born to be like that, we were born to be infinitely creative and entrepreneurial and so um, offering people the opportunity to get access to working capital to start things like social businesses which solve humanitarian problems might be, um, might be a way to slow down if not not reverse the um, effects of the broken capitalist system. And zero net carbon emissions as well is, uh, that really encapsulates, you know, aside for some of the examples that I have in Grameen of how they've switched from fossil fuels to um, uh, mobile solar um, uh, homes, is that we're shifting away from a growth extractive economy, so growth at any cost, growth at the cost of killing the environment, <coughs> growth at the cost of exploiting our brothers and sisters, um, uh, you know, growth 
deigning to masquerade as innovation and continuous improvement capability in an organisation. Actually, it was horrifying for me when I genuinely thought that I was hired to be the continuous improvement manager because we really cared about um, a growth mindset and continuously improving. And I learnt really quickly that that was just a euphemism for making lots of people redundant. Um, and, and so I guess for us, the challenge is that mindset shift from the fixed mindset, which has a fear of failure, to the growth mindset, which is, um, you know, believes that every human can improve and ought to be able to realise their potential. And I guess in closing, a roadmap to a, a better future. I mean, there is no better roadmap than the people that we have in this room, um, I, I would say. But also, one of the questions I often get asked is, how do these kind of um, concepts translate to a developed world? Sure, you can have social business chicken farms, but what about in Australia? Well, I'll give you um, a technology example and I'll give you a like backyard example. The technology example is, and when you think about the millennials of the future that are going to change the world, um, two incredible young men who both had corporate backgrounds decided um, <laughs> somewhat in a cliched fashion um, on their road trip in Kashmir um, that they would make a pact that they would not use their business acumen for evil. Um, and they would somehow turn their talents into something that could offer social good. So instead of being the hedge fund manager and management consultant at Accenture that they were, um, they decided that they would look to disrupt an existing um, industry and kind of Trojan horse social good into it. And the industry that they chose to disrupt is the ticketing industry. So this organisation is called Humanitics. They are a tech startup. They um, are disrupting at the intersection of for-profit and not-for-profit. What they're doing is they've looked at the ticketing industry, they've created a ticketing platform called Humanitics, and out of the booking fees, which everybody resents anyway, 100% of the profits are deployed to a charity of the event organiser's choice at no cost to the event organiser, which means the charity ecosystem gets an enhanced distribution of funds. Uh, event organisers get to increase their brand value, but also get access to a social cause that they're passionate about where they previously had no access. Um, and the ticketing platform basically just kind of runs itself and is a, it's, a, it's another option, it offers option value for us customers. And it's cheaper where normally fair trade and other, doing the ethical thing is more expensive. This is actually equal to or, or less expensive than the incumbent. So that's a way of looking at a market problem, a social problem, combining them and disrupting. Uh, but what if you don't want to go and hire yourself a developer and create a ticketing platform? Well, this amazing lady in Grafton, regional New South Wales, she's phenomenal. She's like, she, she's a businesswoman, she's an elected councillor, she's on the board of the Bendigo Community Bank that's supporting one of our ventures. And she said to me, I think I've accidentally created a social business. And I'm like, of course you have. Um, and she said, well, because her business is running caravans, so she manages caravan parks, her and her husband. And once, uh, I think last year, they, they failed to get a contract. And so it meant that two of their employees were out of a job and um, one of them had a, um, a mental health issues and the other one was disabled. And she felt really um, quite bad about that. She took responsibility for them and was like, well, how do I give these guys jobs? So she decided to create a business where she would um, uh, connect them with widows who didn't have their husbands to do kind of the handyman work and some of the work around the house, like leaves and gutters and whatnot. So they were able to then perform um, that job in the interim while she was, um, her and her husband were pitching for other contracts. And so that's a really kind of easy way to uh, create a social big business in your own backyard or indeed somebody else's, so to speak. Uh, so I guess in closing, um, you know, how to, how to overcome your fear of failure and, and do pursue social innovation when everybody said you couldn't. I love thinking about when Professor Yunus was at the World Bank and they were um, challenging him and saying that he was turning banking on its head. Um, and he fired back, he goes, no, it's currently on its head, I'm turning it on its feet. Um, and everybody said that he couldn't do it in Bangladesh. Everybody said that you're absolutely batshit cannot do it. And then he ended up doing it and transforming, you know, 8.8 .8 million people's lives. And then they said, you can't do it in America. And then of course he did it in America. We've got 100,000 women borrowers there now. The recovery rates are 99.95%, which is an order, you know, greater even than, dare I say it, Donald Bradman. Um, and <laughs> he, you know, he's, he's now issued a billion dollars worth of loans in a developed country. And that's certainly something that 
We are hoping to take inspiration from Ingram in Australia because we're currently doing our microfinance feasibility study right here. Um, well, not right here, but in Grafton and in Broadmeadows and in Fairfield. And we're constantly being told that we, it can't happen in Australia for all the reasons why it couldn't happen elsewhere. Uh, and, you know, it's a high profile venture. And do I have a fear of failure around it? Definitely. Will we not do it because of that? No. And I think anything worth transforming and anything worth sort of shifting and moving into has to have an element of terror, which, you know, as you move through it, um, reveals itself to you as excitement um, and potential and in many ways joy. And I'd leave you with that because the seventh tenet of social business is in fact do it with joy. So I've certainly enjoyed tonight and I hope you have too.